Welcome Pastor Lisa as she comes to speak tonight. Thank you so much. So good to see each and every one of you. Are you ready to, uh, to read the Bible tonight, to study the Bible, to hear from God tonight? Amen. I just have that in my heart when we sing, I've, uh, that we sing, I, I've seen God move some mountains and he's going to do it again. And I'm just telling you, God is about to move some mountains in your life. He's about to remove some things in your life that have been there, it seems like forever, but God is about to set you free. Amen. He's moving mountains. Say that with me. He's moving mountains. Amen. Amen. You can turn in your Bible to Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. We're going to read there in just a moment. Again, it's so good to see each and every one of y'all. I believe that God is going to encourage you and strengthen you tonight. We welcome those of you who are watching online. We love that you join us here in this service, and we just bless you tonight. And we pray God's blessings on you and your whole family. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about this, the power of God's Word in your personal life. And I want to talk to you about the difference that the Word of God will make in your personal life, say, in my life. And my prayer for you tonight is that uh, God would begin to stir up a hunger and a thirst in you for the Word of God like you've never had before. And I just pray that God will give you wisdom and revelation from the word that you need right now for your situation. And I just, and my prayer is that God will begin to cause you to live out of a new level when it comes to walking in the authority of the word of God. That's my prayer tonight. Father, we, that is our prayer. And we say, grant it in the name of Jesus. You know, I was thinking about Jesus and how God led him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights in order to fast and pray. And as always, guess who shows up? Satan shows up in the wilderness. And he comes to tempt Satan, uh, tempt Jesus. And so three times he, he came with these strong proposals. If you will do this, if you will do this, if you will do this. And three times Jesus answered him back strongly. He said, Satan, in essence, I will not do it because it is written. You see, Jesus... Uh, with, uh, Jesus fought the enemy, defeated the enemy with the written word of God. And so I say that to know that you have to know the word in order to even use it in combat with your enemy. When you know the word, when you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. It's, it's the word that you know that will set you free. And Hebrews 4.12 tells us about the Bible and the Word of God. You know, the Bible is the Word of God. And it says this, For the Word of God is living, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is not like any other book. It is not like any other book in this world. It is full of the life of God. The Bible says it is living and it is powerful. Every scripture is God-breathed. That's amazing. Think about that. It is God-breathed and it is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Men wrote down the Bible, but God is the author of the Bible. He is the author. It is divinely inspired. It is the inerrant, the infallible word of God. And it will change your life. And, the, and this scripture says it's like a sword that will cut through the lies of the enemy. Jeremiah 23, 28 says this. God said, my word is like a fire. My word is like a hammer that will break rocks in pieces. It is, it, that's an illustration to show us the power of God's word. It's not like any other book. You see, as you uh, declare the Word of God, as you stand on the Word of God, it will break through the hard places of your life. Amen? Listen to this scripture. 2 Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies, we should desire the milk of the Word that we may grow up and taste the, that the Lord is gracious. We need the Word to grow up. And when we begin to get into the Word of God, we begin to taste the goodness of God. You know, babies, babies want milk and they want milk all the time, don't they? And they need the milk 
in order to grow. And Peter was saying, listen, like a baby, you need to begin to crave the word of God so that you can grow up spiritually, so that you can begin to experience and taste the goodness of God in your life. I'm talking about the power of the word of God in your life. If I can influence you in any way today, it would be to stir up in you a love for God's word. Say, I love the word of God. I want to crave the Word of God. You know, sometimes we think that this is a book of do's and don'ts and that we just have to read it to make God happy. We read it because it's just a ritual that we have been told to do. We want God to be happy with us, and it becomes this chore or legalistic ritual. But, you know, we are really missing the whole point. We read the Bible because we want to know the one who wrote it. We want to know the will of God. The Bible is our Christian manual that shows us the way. I'm going to get comfortable here a minute. This is what I really love about the Bible. Hold on just a second. I woke up like this. I just want to make a point. I think I'll just put my legs up here. Because when I get up every morning, I wash my face, put on my anti-wrinkle cream. The older I get, the more I put on. I get my cup of coffee, and I open the Word of God, and it speaks to me. It's just not something that you can't understand. You know, we all want to hear from God. So the best way we can hear from God is to get into the Word of God. We all want to feel the presence of God. The best way to feel the presence of God is to get His Word. When I pick up the Bible, when I read the Bible, when I handle the Bible in the morning, it's like I'm touching God. Sometimes I just hug the Bible. I say, God, I love you. Because this is the closest I can get to him. It's It's the powerful word of God. Sometimes I kiss it and I say, Jesus, I love you. The word of God is powerful, but the word of God is so practical for your everyday life. And if, and when you just take the time in the morning to, or in the morning or whatever time you can to just spend time with the Lord, this word will speak to you. I like to say it like this, the Word of God, it's like a treasure chest. And every time I open it, I find something new. And the more I find, the more I like. And the more I read, the more God reveals His Word to me. You know, when my parents were growing up, the reason I'm I'm just sitting here today for a minute is because this is what I saw my parents do. Every morning of our lives, sitting in their recliners in the morning, my mother got up, fixed us breakfast, We were just running around, getting ready for school, eating, and they'd be sitting there reading their Bible. Sometimes my mother would just have her hands up in the air, all in her own little world, praying to God. And you know, they showed us a love for the Word of God, and they enjoyed doing it. And so when I was about, oh, when I was a young girl and I could read well, you know, they gave me my first Bible to read, my own Bible, not just a little Bible, but a real Bible. And I'll never forget my parents said to me, Read this Bible as if it is God talking to you. And my dad said this. He says, now mark in your Bible. Do not be afraid to mark in your Bible. When God speaks to you, you can mark in it. You can write down scriptures because it's a love letter from God to you. And I'll never forget that he said that to me. And it made such a difference in my life because I believed my parents and I began to read it. And it is literally shaped and changed my whole life. All because I just take the time and you take the time to get up and put the Word of God into your life. I mean, I know friends, one of my best friends, when she, the church she grew up in, she was taught, no, you don't ever read the Bible. You let us interpret the Bible for you. But this Bible is for you. And it will bring you close to God. 
And when you touch it and when you handle it, it's like you're touching and handling God. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, I don't know what the Bible is, especially the Old Testament or the begots or the begats or whatever, the genealogies. You know, you can just skip over those things that, if you need to. But just think about it. In this Bible, we start with Genesis. And Genesis is the beginning of man. It shows us God is our creator, the creator of the worlds. And then we get into the history books the several history books, and it talks about and shows us that God chose a man named Abraham and a people called the Israelites to be his chosen people. And for the next few uh, uh, history books, you read about the Israelites and how God led them and how he dealt with them and how they disobeyed God and how they obeyed God. And, and what we can do, the Bible says, we look back at those stories and we, we are encouraged from them and we learn from their mistakes and we learn from their victories and then we see the great miracles and we say, if God did that for them, he can do it for us. And then you get into the, the book of Psalms and the book of Psalms just teaches us that, that we, can, uh, we can talk to God out of our hearts. It shows us how to worship God, what we can say. When you're alone and you don't know what to say to God, just get into the Psalms and it'll show you how to worship. And then you get into the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, and, and you learn such practical things like women, if you nag your wife too much, they're going to go live in the attic of a house. And you learn, you know, that if, if a soft answer turns away wrath, you learn that you save money little by little. Don't, don't depend on the lottery. Just put that money in a savings little by little and your money will grow and you'll be blessed. You didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Not the lottery part, but the other part. <laughs> then you get into the prophetic books, and the prophetic books talk about what God is doing, what he has done, how he has fulfilled. You can read the prophetic books. You may not understand it all, but you can study about it. God has fulfilled so many things he has said. And then he is, he is prophesying about the future, and you can bet on it what God said will come to pass. And then you get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, and, and that's all about the life of Jesus. I mean, it, it's the disciples talking about Jesus, whom they, who they saw, who they knew, who they loved, and, and they show us who God really is because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And so you see that Jesus is a loving and a good God, and he, he went around healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. And that he loved people and he lifted people and he never got onto people and he never condemned people, but he only chastised the religious people because they were so far separated from, from the real life people and what they went through and the needs that they had. And he said, you do things for a show. And then he just, he just went to the people who were down and out. And we should be willing to go to the down and out and the up and out and whoever, but we should be God's love on this earth. And then you get into the book of Acts. You know that, what that means? It's the book of action. It shows the disciples in action after Jesus went to heaven. And it shows how by the, with the power of the Holy Spirit, they did the works that Jesus did. And the book of Acts is a picture of how we can live a spirit-filled life on this earth. And then the next few books are the letters that the apostles wrote. There are letters to the believer. Some were written from prison, the apostle Paul. Others just because they couldn't, couldn't travel like we can today. And so they wrote letters. And in these letters, we learn what it means to live the Christian life, who we are in Christ Jesus, what we have in Christ Jesus, how to walk in love, how to treat people, uh, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, we learn how to live the Christian life. And then we come to the book of Revelations. That's the very end. And it's, it's the end time story, how God is going to wrap it up in the end and Jesus is going to come on a white horse. I tell you what, it's powerful. It's, it's, it's better than any movie you've ever seen. I love what Billy Graham said. I've read the last book and we win. You know, we win. You may not understand everything in Revelations, but you can understand this. If you're a believer, you're going to be with Jesus and you win. Amen. Amen and amen. So that's the Bible in a nutshell. And it's, and it's so powerful. You know, what I love about the Bible is this. You don't have to understand it all to receive from it. 
Some people get tripped on, up on, well, how could God do this? Or how did that happen? Or why did that happen? Hey, you don't have to understand it all. Just let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. Just read and act on what you do know. Amen? And what else I love about the Bible is that we have an interpreter and his name is the Holy Spirit. He is your helper. He is your teacher. And he will guide you into all truth. And when you read this Bible, the Holy Spirit sits down with you. And he illuminates the word to you. Maybe you've tried on your own and, and, and you're just so closed off. And next time you sit down and read the Bible, you just say, Holy Spirit, reveal your word to me. Holy Spirit, help me to understand it. See, we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'm getting out of this hot road. I sort of like preaching without shoes, though, to tell you the truth. If you will continually put the Word of God in you, putting it in you on a continual basis, it'll come out of you when you need it. And that's what's so important. Sometimes, I, and I'll have to admit, I read the Bible, and it's maybe not so exciting that day. Sometimes I think, well, I, I think my mind was on so much, I don't know if I caught it, but let me tell you something. Your spirit's catching it. And you don't have to feel wonderful to read the Bible and get something out of it. Because the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance when you need it. I think about my brother Paul, and he tells the story so much better than I will, but when he was in college, in the, um, in the summertime, he went on, went on a trip, to a mission trip to Africa. And during that trip, he got sick, and so they sent all the, the guys out to, for the project that day or the ministry that day, and he said, I'll stay back because I'm sick. But what he didn't realize that he had malaria. He had con contacted malaria. And so he was so sick and he was alone, no one there. And Paul said that he couldn't think, he couldn't pray, he couldn't read the Bible. He was probably, to, uh, when I thought about this today, Paul, probably the devil was trying to end your life right there because he knew that you'd be going back to Africa over and over again. And so, I mean, if that wouldn't scare somebody off, that could have right there. But Paul said laying there in that state, he said his spirit was alive. And he said, what came up out of his spirit was by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. He said what came out of his spirit were the things that he had put in him and that he'd heard when he was a young boy. And that began to penetrate his mind and penetrate his body. And he began to agree with the word of God. And that sickness broke over his body with no medication, with no help. When you put the word of God in you, on a consistent basis, it will come out of you when you really need it. Amen. So let's talk about this. What happens when you read the Bible? Because there are certain transactions, there are certain impartations that take place when you sit down and read the Bible. And so I'm going to give you a few of them tonight. And remember, I always have my outline online with all the scriptures and all the points. I'm going to sort of quote a lot of scriptures tonight, but you can always pick them up on my outline. Let me read one scripture to you, James 1, verse 23 and 24. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. Number one is this, the word of God is your true mirror. The Word of God is your true mirror. If you want to know your true self, if you want to know why you were created, what your purpose is, you got to look into the mirror of God's Word. And don't allow people to tell you who you are or who you are not. Don't allow the, don't, don't let the lies of the enemy get the best of you. Let God define you through the mirror of His Word. I can tell you right now that I can just think of a few things. You are God's masterpiece. You are created for a purpose and on purpose. Amen. You are forgiven. And listen to this. Your shame has been washed away. The former shame is gone. That's who you really are. 
Some of you are just living in that sense of shame, but God wants you to be free from that sense of shame. And he's saying, look into the mirror of my word and see who you really are. Live like you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Live like you're anointed. Live like you're my ambassador. Live like you're free from sin and you're free from shame. Amen. You are a holy people set apart to God. That's who you really are. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 says, Christ also loved the church and he gave himself up that he might sanctify us. And listen to this, cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. You need the word of God to wash out some wrong stinking thinking. You need that word to wash off the shame, to cleanse off the insecurity, to cleanse off the past so you can begin to see who you really are in Christ Jesus. Just because you have been defeated doesn't mean you are, uh, that doesn't mean that you'll be defeated the rest of your life. Just because you've been rejected doesn't mean you'll be that way the rest of your life. You are accepted by God himself. He has a great plan for your life, amen? The second point is this, the word of God is food for your spirit. How many of you know when we don't eat, we get weak? When you don't feed your spirit, your spirit is weak. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Without the word, we are spiritually malnourished. God's word is your daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. God's word is our daily bread. And we need a daily word from him. How many of you know that? We are spirit beings, we live in a body, we have a soul which is our mind, will, and emotions. And you know, you think about it, we are very careful to feed our bodies, aren't we? Three meals a day and snacks on top of that. And then we're very careful about taking care of our emotions, you know? We do fun things, we talk things out with people, we have girlfriends, we have guy friends, and so we take care of our emotions, and just like we take care of our bodies and our emotions, we must take care of our spirit. The spirit is the real you. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Too many times we allow our emotions and our feelings to control us, But when we put the word of God in our spirit, that's when we become stable and strong spiritually. Let me give you an example. A lion is a strong, powerful animal. It is intimidating, it is dominating. But if you stop feeding that lion for a long time, if you stop letting that lion exercise, after weeks soon, that lion will be powerless to hurt you. And I just wanna say, when you stop feeding the wrong things in your life, They don't control you anymore. So stop feeding the flesh, starve the flesh and feed your spirit, amen. And this is our spirit food, say spirit food. Another thing is this, when you read the word of God, it will expose wrong thinking. How many of you know we all have a little bit of that? It's just the way it is. Uh, the word of God is like a double-edged sword that cuts through your soul and spirit and it, and it helps you know what is right from wrong and it helps you discern what is God's best for your life. I think about my dad and how when he was a young pastor and, and believer, he, he just loved God with all his heart. He, all he wanted to do is preach and get people saved, but he had this one uh, hang up this wrong one thing wrong thinking in this one area and that is he felt like he was a true Christian if he was going to be a humble Christian that he needed to remain poor and poor he was he struggled financially he grew up uh, on a cotton farm and and they were the poorest of all people he didn't have much he was used to not having much and he struggled financially even when my my mom and dad got married they struggled financially but one day God opened his eyes when he began to read in the word that God is a God who blesses his people that he desires to meet our needs that, that, that when we give 10% of our income to the Lord, that something happens in the spiritual realm and that the windows of heaven are open and pours out blessings upon our lives. And it's okay to be blessed in life because God takes care of his children. 
And he realized that what he had was this poverty attitude and poverty mentality and poverty spirit. And thank God he rose up with the, with the revelation of the word of God and said, no more will I live like this. God doesn't want me to live in lack. I'm going to be blessed and I'm going to evangelize the world. And he said this too, I will, I'm going to, my children are going to be blessed. My grandchildren are going to be blessed. And little by little, he came out of that. And I'm telling you, thank God. No telling where we'd be today if he hadn't have done that. He he had to believe God for an 8,000-seat sanctuary. He had to believe God for the money for television to to preach all over the world. Thank God he got free from that poverty spirit. Some of you need to get free from that poverty spirit tonight, I think. Just like my dad. Hey, listen, this is your heritage as a part of Lakewood Church. God is saying, what I did for your founder, I'm going to do for you. And you have to come to the point. You have to come to the point where you just say, no, no, this is not right. I don't see a way out, but God is my way out. And I will obey God and I will tithe and and I I will walk out of this poverty and I choose blessing. Choose prosperity. People say, y'all are just prosperity preachers, and we don't preach much about it, but I tell you, we're not poverty preachers. If my kids walked around barely getting along, what would you think of me? And if God's kids are walking around and they never have enough, they're not blessed, that is an indictment on God. But that's not the way God is. He blesses his people. But you have to know the Word of God. You have to decide enough is enough. You have to get into the Bible and look up all the scriptures on finances. And you'll see that God will break that spirit of poverty over you. I think we ought to do it right now. If you have never done that, and this is revelation in your spirit, stand up right now. Because there there has to be a time. I want you to go home. And I want you to write down this in your Bible someplace. And I want you to write down on this day, I broke the spirit of poverty over my life. And I refuse to live in lack. And I am a child of God. And I will live under the blessings of God. And Father, from this time on, I expect money to come in. I expect blessings to come in. I expect favor to come in. And you expect it. You expect it. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus. I'm going to have you say it. Father, Father, today today, I have revelation from your word. And I'm done with poverty. I'm done with lack. I'm done with that mentality. Because it's not your will. And in the name of Jesus, Satan, I take authority over you and say you have no power in Jesus' name over my finances, I step over into the blessings of God, into prosperity, into success, into the place of no lack, into the place of no need. And I declare that I will be blessed financially all the days of my life. My children will be blessed. My grandchildren will be blessed. Because tonight, something happened in the spirit realm. In Jesus' name, I am free. Woo, yes. You're free, you're free. You are free. You are free. You are free. free. Amen. Amen. You watch God. You obey God in your finances and you watch what he'll do. You watch what he'll do. Number four, the word of God will bring stability into your life. In Matthew 7, 24, you know the story how Jesus said the man who builds his house on the rock, his life on the rock of the word of God, when the storms come, it will stand strong. But if you don't build your house on the word of God, when the storm comes, you will crumble and fall. And so God is saying that the Word of God is your sure foundation. You have to build your house 
on the Word of God. I've said it many times, and I'll continue to say it. One of the greatest things I've ever done to produce stability in my life is just to spend time in the Word and in prayer every day. Just spending time with the Lord because it's my strong foundation. When my mother, when our mother was diagnosed with cancer in 1981, the doctors told her that she only had a few weeks to live. She was only 48 years old. There was nothing they could do. She looked like death already. We were concerned, we were sad. But I was thinking about that situation not long ago and I looked back and I realized several things took place that caused that situation to turn around. And I'm going to share them with you. The first thing is that my dad immediately declared his faith and said, we have a God of miracles. God is a God of miracles. He does, he's done miracles for us and he will do miracles now. And, and so that when he spoke that word of God, you know, it's totally set the pace and the tone of faith in our household. The second thing we did is we laid our hands on our mother and we prayed for her because the Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. And so we had known that. Had we not known that, we couldn't do that. But see, when you put the Word of God in you, then faith will come out. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. And the, the, this was the biggest storm we'd ever faced. My mother could have died at 48 years of age. But listen, the third thing I remember is that my mother declared the Word of God constantly. She, she never went to bed except at nighttime. She would still work and she would go around the house saying, uh, I declare that I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. She would say, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And so because our parents knew the word and because they stood on the word of God, I believed that we would get a miracle. I was in my early 20s, but you know what? That just set the pace for me. I thought, my parents have faith, I have faith that my mother is going to be healed. And so that is the power of putting the Word of God in your heart. My parents targeted to the Word, my parents targeted the Word of God instead of dwelling on the worst. They targeted the Word of God. They said, God, our faith is in you. Our faith is in your Word. And so, of course, you know the story. My mother's healed. She's 84 years old today. <laughs> Healthy and strong. When you build your house on the Word, you will withstand the storms of life. The fifth thing that happens is when you read the Word, it refreshes your soul. I mean, have you ever just been down and you get in the Word or you hear the teaching of the Word and you're not the same? Because the Word has life in it. You see, there's actual life in the Word. It refreshes you like nothing else. Your joy level may be down, but when you get into the Word of God, the Bible says in Psalm 1918 that His Word gives joy to your heart. See, this is why we need our daily bread. Do you see the transactions that are taking place? The impartations, the sixth thing that happens is the Word, the Bible says the Word will make you wise. Psalm 19.7 says... Uh, yeah, Psalm 19.7, I went sure I got that right. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. One scripture says that his word is my counselor. We need the counsel of the word of God. And let me tell you something, there's a difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And we need the wisdom of God. And, and, and when you put the word of God in you, you will begin to make better decisions and, and God will impart his wisdom into your life and you will begin to think on a higher level because you will begin to think like God thinks. Think about that scripture in Isaiah 55 that says, uh, my thoughts, his thoughts, his ways are much higher than our ways. And he said, when I send my word forth, it will not return to me void. It will not return to me without results, but it will accomplish what I desire. You see, and so... God wants you to live on his level of thinking. He wants to begin to think like you. Uh, he wants you to think like him. He wants to impart wisdom into your life. You know, I have a good friend, and she told me that her husband has an amazing job. He invests money for, you know, people that are multimillionaires and billionaires. And, and he's, she said, he's always successful. And I said, man, that's awesome. And she said to me, she said, but Lisa, he's in the Word all the time. And she said, he's always asking for wisdom and he doesn't make any investments without asking.
asking for the wisdom of God. And she said, God always leads him in the right way. And so he's risen to the top in his company. Listen, God can drop one thing in your spirit that can change your whole life as you're in the word of God. Another thing that happens, number seven, is that the word gives light to your eyes, gives understanding, revelation. You know, the Bible says that God's word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. So it's like a, it's like a light that shines the light on your path so you know which way to go. You see, so many of our decisions can be based on the word of God. Sometimes you ever see a young Christian just making a, a wrong decision and you think, If they would have just read the word, they'd know not to do that. There's so many. I mean, the Bible tells us, for example, that to follow peace in making decisions. If you don't have peace in your spirit, if you have this lack of peace, this disturbance in your heart, that's God speaking to you saying, don't make that decision. Don't do that. The Bible teaches us things like don't be joined together with unbelievers. Don't be marrying an unbeliever or running around all the time with unbelievers because it's important who you run around with. You need to be with people who are like-minded so you'll be encouraged. The Bible teaches us that that, uh, we will not prosper if we hide our sin. But when we confess our sin, we will receive mercy. You see, that I'm just showing you there's so many things that are in the Bible that we need to know that will help us just live uh, our everyday life and will shine a light on our pathway so that we will make the right decisions. You'll begin to have light and revelation. Number eight, and I'll just mention it real quick, the Word of God will warn you. It will warn you of danger. It will warn you of evil. Psalm 1911 says, by your word, your servant is warned. It will keep you from making mistakes. Number nine is this. There are rewards that come in keeping God's word. I love this. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Sometimes we feel like, you know, God just doesn't want us to have fun. God just doesn't want us to enjoy pleasure. God's not even like that. God wants you to enjoy all his beautiful earth, but he does want to keep you from things that will harm you. And he does want to protect you. And he knows that certain things will lead to destruction and certain things will lead to rewards and certain things will lead to blessing in your life. And we ju- when we just get to the place, God, I just trust you. You made me. You made this earth. I just trust you, and I am going to obey what you said in the Word. And it may be hard at times, but I'm going to bite the bullet, and I'm going to do it. And when you begin to take steps like that of obedience, man, it becomes easier and easier. It may be contrary to what you usually do or how you've lived, but God knows what is best for your life. Amen? Psalm 1911 says that in keeping your word, there is great reward. It is more precious than gold, sweeter than honey to your spirit and your soul. Having God's word in your heart is more important than having any material possession. It is sweeter to your life. See, that's a picture of how sweet your life will be when you continue in God's word. That doesn't mean you won't have problems. How many of you know that? But I tell you what, I don't know what I'd do without Jesus in my life. I I know that when I have problems, he will get me through it. I know that I will be the victor and not the victim. Your life goes better with Jesus. Your life goes better with Jesus. Number 10, God's word will keep you from sin. Because Psalm 119, says, I have hidden my word and your word in my heart that I might sin again, that I might not, I'll read that over. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, when you, when you know the word of God, then the Holy Spirit's going to convict you when you're about to sin. Or if you sin, because we will sin. But the Holy Spirit, you didn't have that when you were in the world, did you? The Holy Spirit wasn't in you to tell you you did wrong. You liked it sometimes. But when you are in the Word, you know the Word, then the Holy Spirit says, remember what the Word of God says? Okay, you did wrong. You need to repent of that sin, and He freely forgives us. Number 11, the Word of God corrects and trains you for every good work. This is so important because God tells us that He shows us that He wants us to do something in life, and He doesn't always just throw us in it. He has to train us. 
And you have to, to be a success, you need to learn to be a student of God's Word first. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all skip, Scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We need to be rebuked sometime, don't we? We need to be trained. We need to be developed. But it's so that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God is getting ready for what he has, getting you ready for what he has for you. Say, he's getting me ready. He's training me. Amen. And then the last thing, but let's remain in our seats because I want to pray with you. The 12th thing is this, the word of God will bring you great peace. Because the Bible says in Psalm 119, 165, great peace have those who love your word and nothing will make them stumble. That's powerful. Do you see why it's important to know the word of God? To get into the word of God. It's your daily bread. It's your spirit food. And we need to make sure our spirits are strong. Don't neglect your spirit. Amen. Sometimes we wonder why we don't have victory, why we are discouraged, but you have to make sure you're in the Word of God. And I'm going to end with this practical thing. Some of you may be thinking, how do I do it? Well, number one, get a Bible translation that's easy to understand. I recommend the New International Version or the New Living Translation, but you can get one that's easy for you. Here's a simple Bible reading plan. Just a simple Bible reading plan. Because if you don't have a, somewhat of a plan, you might not do it. You might not follow through on it. Start in Matthew and read one chapter there every morning. And then we read one proverb and one Psalms. That's for wisdom and encouragement. Just start there. If you want to add a chapter in Genesis, read the Old Testament too. But just, just start somewhere and read systematically through. And then the third thing is this. I love these prayers from the Bible. The psalmist said, um, Lord, open my eyes as I read your word and, and that I may behold wondrous things from your law. I love that. Just say, God, open my eyes as I read your word. The other one is from Paul in Ephesians 1. God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. As I read your word, I want to hear from you. I just want to stir you up to have such a love for the word of God. And to know it's not a chore, it's not a legalistic ritual. It's for you. It's so you will be strong. It's so you'll be encouraged. It's so you'll make better decisions. It's so you'll have the wisdom of God in your life. The last scripture I'm going to read to you is this. Philippians 2.15. And it says, Live clean, innocent lives as children of God shining like bright stars in a world full of crooked, crooked and perverse people, holding firmly, listen, holding firmly to this word of life. You have to hold firmly to this word of life. This word of life is for you. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I encourage you to get into it. Why don't you bow your heads just a moment? Did that help you tonight? Can you believe I got 12 points in? <laughs> they were quick. Bow your heads just a moment. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. I want to ask you tonight if you're here and you say, Lisa, I really haven't been consistent in this reading of the word. And I just want to make a commitment in my heart to the Lord by raising my hand that I'm going to start being consistent in the word. Raise your hand right now. Put it right back down. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you so much. This is a new day for you. Thank you. If you're here tonight, you say, Lisa, I don't really know Jesus Christ. I have never prayed this salvation prayer and accepted him as my Lord and Savior. If I died tonight, I don't know where I'd spend eternity, but I want to pray the salvation prayer with you. I want you to raise your hand right now all over the congregation. Amen. I see those hands. Amen. Amen. I'm looking to my left now. Amen. Thank you. You can put your hand down. If you're here tonight and you say, Lisa, I've known the Lord and served him, but I've been away from God and I want to rededicate my life to the Lord and I want to get in on that prayer, raise your hand right now. Amen. I see those hands. I'm going to ask you, you can put them down, but I'm going to ask you to do something bold. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And when you stand up, you're saying, 
God, I'm not ashamed of you. I accept Jesus into my life, and I will serve you all the days of my life. Do that right now while the congregation gives you a hand clap, and then we're going to pray together. And the ushers are going to put something into your hand. Amen, amen. Everyone that raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, stand up right now. Let the ushers put something into your hands. God bless y'all. All of you, it's so awesome. Give them a good hand clap. This is a new day for you. It's a new day. It's a new day. Let's pray this prayer together, the whole congregation. Say, oh God, I come to you right now just as I am. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. And tonight I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my own wrongdoing. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want to serve you all the days of my life. And I thank you, God, that you have heard my prayer and you have forgiven me. You have erased my sins. My past is gone. I have a new beginning, a new heart with a new start. And I thank you that I'm now your child. And I commit to you on March 7th, 2018, to serve you all the days of my life. Help me get free from any sin, any bondage, any addiction that I have had. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. That's awesome. Bless you. You may be seated. I love it. I love it. I love it. My favorite part of ministering is the altar call because we get people into heaven. Amen. God bless you all. We love you. We'll see you this weekend. T.D. Jakes is going to be here.